morning. I'm Nadia Gill, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Before I do, here are four important facts about Dory Clark. Number one, our speaker is a legend. She's the number one communication coach in the world. She's also a top 50 business thinker in the world and has been described by the New York Times as an expert at self-reinvention, helping others make changes in their lives. Number two, she teaches at Duke University and is also the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of four books, The Long Game, Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You, and Stand Out, which was named the number one leadership book of the year. Number three, our speaker is the proud mom of two very mischievous cats, Heath and Phil. Number four, this is our speaker's fourth talk at Google. The previous three talks, Reinventing You, Stand Out and Entrepreneurial You are classics at the talks at Google YouTube channel with over 100,000 views. Please help me welcome speaker, teacher, author, coach, and legend, Dory Clark, for her fourth Google talk, How to be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. Nadia, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And let's go ahead and dive in. So we're going to start the slide share here, and uh, we will investigate this question, which I think a lot of us have been thinking about over the past couple of years, certainly as uh, we have all experienced collectively the pandemic, the question of long-term thinking has become a little bit more salient. Because, you know, we can we can remember back 2020, 2021, uh, for most of us, things didn't really go the way that we thought they were going to go. We were thrown into, I, I would say, a maelstrom of short-term thinking. And it was necessary at the time, right? We didn't have a lot of options. All of a sudden, we experienced things we had never experienced before. We have social distancing. We had to figure out what that was. We had basically bread lines at grocery stores. We all moved out of our offices and suddenly began doing remote work. And after a while, remote work often began to feel a little bit like this, where we were struggling with how to stay connected with our teams, with the people we were working with. How do you navigate the sort of work-life balance and boundaries? These were incredibly challenging questions that over the past two years we had to deal with. We were just trying to navigate the things that were being thrown at us, really. And so in many ways, we have to just pause and say, okay, we did what we could. We did as well as we could in those circumstances. Those are times, crises are times when short-term thinking actually is important because what you need is to be nimble. What you need is to be able to react effectively and respond to the stimuli that are in your face. But it's also equally true that when we are faced with these questions of short-term and long-term, short-term thinking is a useful tool to have in your toolkit. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's relevant in certain circumstances, not all circumstances. And so I have been thinking a lot, both during the pandemic for sure, but also before it, about the question of long-term thinking. What does it mean? Why is it important? And how can we, as I believe we should, begin to rebalance the portfolio a little bit. If the last two years have all been about short-term thinking, what would it mean for us to recalibrate ourselves a little bit more toward the long-term? And I think in general, the interesting thing, there's a lot of agreement about its value, right? When it comes to strategic thinking, there was a study that was done a few years ago by an organization called a management research group. It was a survey of 10,000 senior executives. And they asked them, what is the most important thing, the number one thing that can lead to your business's success? What is truly crucial? 
and 97% had the same answer. Their answer was strategic thinking. There is almost unanimous agreement that strategic thinking is a good idea, right? There's not, there's not a lot of people out there that say, oh, the, how terrible, don't do strategic thinking. We all believe it's good. But the interesting thing, the really interesting part of the problem is that even though so many people think it's a great idea, that doesn't mean they do it. There was a separate study about the same time, and they surveyed a bunch of executives, and 96%, almost literally the exact same percentage, 96% said, oops, I don't have time for strategic thinking. Now, of course, we understand, right? We can all empathize. There are too many meetings. There are too many emails. We face all of these things, and it feels like you just don't have the space or you just don't have the bandwidth for these things. I get it. I feel that too sometimes. But there's a big problem here. In my recent book, I wrote uh, this book, The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. I spoke with a friend of mine, a guy named Jonathan Brill, who's a, a futurist and an author, and he said something I thought was quite insightful. He said, in corporate life, the worst thing that we can do, the worst mistake we can make is to take a group of smart, talented, competent people and tell them to win at the wrong thing. Because the problem is they will do it. And you can imagine all of the effort, all of the sweat, the labor, you get to the end of the day and it's all for naught because the goal was wrong to begin with. That is not a scenario that any of us wants for our business, our careers, and yet we run that risk every day if all we do is short-term thinking. It is very easy for humans to get into a rut where they just keep doing the thing they've been doing. For two years, We, of course, all we're doing is, is short-term thinking because, frankly, we felt like we didn't even have a horizon. Things, things could be changing so you know, frequently you could plan something two weeks out and it would end up being canceled because the circumstances on the ground were changing. Our horizons shrank. But I believe that this is the moment, this is the inflection point where we need to recalibrate things. We need to rebalance our portfolio because we do not want to lose by winning at the wrong thing. We need strategic thinking, long-term thinking to make sure that we are actually optimizing for the right goals. And so the question becomes not, is strategic thinking a good thing? Most of us agree it is, but how do we do it? How do we actually make it happen when we are so busy, when we are pulled in so many directions? And so today I want to share with you just a few ideas, a few tips, six ways that each of us can become more of a long-term thinker. How can we amp that up just a bit in our lives? And so I'll be going over some of these principles that I talk about in the long game at a high level, and then we'll be having a guided conversation, a kind of fireside chat with Nadia, and also taking your questions. And so I really look forward to hearing what's on your mind. Um, so we will definitely be taking your questions at the end. Feel free at any point to type them into the chat box. And let's go ahead. So the first thing, which actually I believe is a necessary prerequisite to long-term thinking, it's actually carving out more white space. Now, this is something that, frankly, I know is hard for most professionals, but especially in fast-moving industries like tech. We, on a very consistent basis, have been trying week after week and even year after year to cram 120% of things into 100% of the time and somehow imagine that it will work itself out. Of course, we know the answer. It does not. And it leaves us continually feeling behind, just a little bit behind. We keep thinking, oh gosh, if only I could get a few days to just work and catch up. And yet somehow we never get there. We never, we, we never catch the rabbit, so to speak. And that leads to a kind of breathlessness and a lack of ability to actually enable ourselves to rise up and ask some pretty important questions questions that, that we need to be asking. 
Am I working on the highest value things? What should I be doing? What should I stop doing? What should I be doing more of? These are important questions that if we ask them and really think about it, grapple with it periodically, we are able to make better decisions, but we will never have the cognitive capacity to do it if we are so overloaded. Now, for some people, they might go to the place, oh, well, what I, you know, what I need is a sabbatical. What I need is time off. And, you know, that's great. I'm sure that would help. But the problem is that's often not realistic for most of us, right? We're working hard. It's not like we can take a month off or what have you. This, I believe, though, is a battle that can be won at the margins. Often the difference between feeling busy and feeling overwhelmed may only be an hour or two a week. There's often a tipping point that just sends us over the edge. And what I would like to suggest, which I think is practical, much more practical than you know going off on a sabbatical, is can we reclaim just an hour or two per week? And there are ways that we can do it. It is important to actually explicitly note, to explicitly codify the fact that we need over time to be tightening continually tightening our criteria for what we're saying yes to. Now, I am sure that for most of us, you probably have a pretty good sense of what your highest value activities are. The problem is that you're not getting to spend enough time on them because of all the mishigas around it. And so I think one of the things that we can be doing is to actually be asking ourselves, are there ways I can be more efficient? You may not want to say no to the people that want, you know, the advice, the brainstorming, the, you know, the career tips, whatever. You might want to be a nice person and say yes to all of that. But at a certain point, it becomes hard. So maybe there's just a way you, where you don't have to say no, but you can make it just that much more efficient. Maybe if you keep having a bunch of people that want career advice, instead of meeting with them one-on-one -on -one, once a month, you could have a coffee hour where you bring multiple people together. That's a possibility. Maybe you could write an article codifying whatever tips that you have about you know something that people keep continually wanting advice from you about. Maybe you start by sending people that article and say, oh, I'd love to be helpful. Why don't you read this article, which has my best tips and then if you have follow-up questions, contact me. That way you're actually being helpful to everybody, but it's only the highly motivated people that you're dealing with afterwards. But there's small things around the edges and we need to look for them so that we have the mental space to be asking the right strategic questions. Number two, we have just come out of this challenging time with COVID. And the truth is you may not have actually been able to spend time doing a lot of the things that you know are important. You know, for a lot of us, we were just getting through and things that are important, but I will say discretionary, like networking, let's say, professional development, let's say, these are things that a lot of people have let languish over the past couple of years. I think, first of all, we need to be generous with ourselves and to understand that this is normal. When you go through a crisis, you, you do have to focus and prioritize and triage. That's a part of it. But also, in addition to that, we can now say, all right, now that we are in a position, fingers crossed, where we're beginning to come out of this, where we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel, now is the time that we can rebalance the portfolio. Now is the time that we actually can make a conscious choice to do more of the things that you were doing less of during the pandemic. It's about heads up and heads down mode. There's, there's shifts. There's periods of time where certain things are more appropriate or less appropriate. And now if you've been heads down, all work, all the time, maybe it's time now to begin to lift your head up and do some of the other activities that matter. Now, number three, I, I am here speaking at Google, so I think it's it, it bears mentioning. One of the things that Google, of course, historically is famous for is 20% time, right? You all know this, the idea that you should be spending or can spend up to 20% of your time on, I will call them discretionary activities, things, things that are outside the scope of your regular job, things that are a little more experimental. This is a very cool idea. It's also something I have a feeling that many of you Googlers watching uh, are saying, 
that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> and I am well aware of this. This is something that that was a lauded historical practice. This was something that uh, that led to the invention of Gmail, for God's sake, for Google News. These are really important milestones. But it is also true, according to recent surveys, that not that many Googlers, maybe you know, 10%, according to recent studies, actually take advantage of this. Why? Well, it's the same reason, of course, that strategic thinking is in such short supply. It's because we're busy. It's because we have so many emails and so many meetings. It's very, very hard to pull ourselves away from it when we have such demanding jobs. It is hard, and I get it. I also want to say it's the kind of thing that if you are in a position where it is at all feasible for you to lean in and do it, it's actually a pretty great idea. The concept behind this is incredibly powerful. And for my book, The Long Game, I actually spoke with a, a, a Google employee, and a, 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 I should say an Alphabet employee, you know what I mean. And he's a wonderful guy named Adam Ruxton. And I thought he was actually somebody who really embody this, this uh, concept in a powerful way. Adam started, he's from Ireland, and he started in the Dublin office in 2011. And almost immediately, he decided that it would be great for his skills development and great for his networking to be able to start volunteering and using his 20% time. And so he reached out to the London office and he volunteered to help with the rollout of apps in the European market. That was a project he worked on for a while. He worked on another 20% uh, time project where he was helping businesses develop a kind of uh, 360 uh, kind of online experience so that they could better understand the user experience of their customers. That uh, was something that seems to have worked well and thousands of businesses have actually used it around the globe. That's pretty cool. But probably the most significant 20% time for him was he had a friend that worked at X and there was a self-driving car initiative that he heard about and he said, oh, I in. And so he volunteered, he begged, can I please be involved? And so he he did. He was doing some, some research um, on sort of general questions about how consumers adopt new technologies. And you know, it was not incredibly earth-shattering, high-level stuff, but as he said, he helped where he could. And as a result, he built connections, he built relationships. And when a job opening came open at X, when they were rebranding they tapped Adam, and he now has a job uh, doing marketing at X full time. It was a great example of how to leverage this. And I know for so many of us, it is not an easy thing to do. We are already pushing ourselves. And also, if during the pandemic especially, you were over-indexing on other things, you know, just trying to get through the day, just trying to get it done, for many of us, this is the time when we actually have to reset things, when we need to think, how can I connect with something that is more joyful in the work that I'm doing? How can I keep myself engaged and interested? And often coming up with our own 20% time project, even if, yes, it's true, we might need to be spending part of our nights or weekends, even if it is 110% time or even 120% time, this may be something that is an important part of our recalibration as we think about what we want to do and who we want to be moving forward. And I will tell you, I try to practice this myself. This is a, a, a screenshot here uh, of me uh, watching one of my songs being performed because for me over the past five years, my 20% time activity has been learning to write musical theater. I went from literally not knowing how to do it at all to actually having completed a musical, having completed several, uh, you know, 10 minute kind of micro musicals and having songs performed by professional actors. So it's, it's kind of a, a cool learning journey for me. Do I know exactly where it's going to lead? No, but that's the nature. It's the experimental nature of 20% time. And so even if it's challenging, I would urge all of us to think about how we can implement it. Even frankly, if it's just 5% time, what can we do to keep ourselves engaged and moving forward and doing something for ourselves so that we keep learning and growing? Now, also, I promised you six quick tips 
And so very briefly, I just want to share a few more from the long game. Something that uh, I talk about um, in the long game, uh, some of you, again, you know, those in the Silicon Valley ecosystem may be familiar with this, but there's a couple of authors, Stephen Kotler and Peter Diamandis, who have written a lot about exponential technology, some of which, uh, some of which Alphabet and X especially are working on, you know, or have worked on in the past, whether it is artificial intelligence or self-driving cars or things like that. And amongst the universe of exponential technologies, meaning technologies that grow at an exponential rate, there is something that Kotler and Diamandis identify as the so-called deception phase. And I love this term. The deception phase is the part where basically progress is naked. If progress is invisible to the naked eye, so if you're following very, very closely, you, you see, oh, you know, it's, it's doubling, it's doubling, it's doubling. But to an average outside person who's not paying close attention, it still looks like zero. It still looks like, okay, uh, you know, it hasn't changed at all in like years. This technology must suck. But of course, that's not true. It's been doubling, doubling, doubling. And at a certain point, a certain breakthrough point, it doubles and all of a sudden you can see it and it's visible and it keeps doubling, you know, just like, just like lily pads on a pond, right? One day the lily pads cover half the pond. The next day, the whole pond is covered and people say, whoa, where did that come from? And it's because they have been lulled into complacency. They've been lulled into thinking it isn't a thing because of the deception phase. And so what I want to say to you is this, this is not just true for exponential technologies, it's true in our careers, that so often what we try to pursue, the things that really matter, our long-term goals, for a long time, it might seem like they're not working, but the truth is they are. If, if we're watching closely, if, we see, if we're looking for and we spot those little signs of progress, other people might not see them, but we know we're getting somewhere. We have to keep the faith. We have to keep moving forward because progress in our own careers is very similar to this with a deception phase of, you know, is it working? Is it working? Is it working? No one can tell. And then success comes there. And it, it becomes a, a challenge and a problem where so many people give up in those moments before it's obvious, but we have to ride through. We have to be willing to ride through the deception phase to get to the good stuff. Along similar lines, one of the things that I try, you know, that I try to talk about, one of the drums that I try to beat frequently in the long game is about how we rethink failure. I mean, so many of us, of course, nobody likes to fail. Um, we're a little bit nervous about, you know, if we try this and it doesn't work, what are the consequences? The truth is, being enmeshed in Silicon Valley and, and the sort of ideologies of Silicon Valley, you all, I'm sure, are very familiar with the lean startup methodology. You know, the basic idea, of course, for viewers or not, is that when you are piloting some kind of a, a new thing, a technology, a service, a product, whatever, you do the minimum viable product. You kind of hash something together just to see if the market is interested in it, just to see, just to test the premise, to see if it works, to see if it's going anywhere. And if it is, then you invest the time to make it better. But you don't invest the time to make it perfect before you determine whether people even want it, right? It's for so long, people have done that. But that's what makes it likely that failure happens, is that you've spent all this money and time on something, and then it becomes tragic if it doesn't work, right? Because so much is already at stake. You want to spend just a little time, a little effort to test it out. And if people don't want it, then okay, fine. No big deal. Let's move on to the next thing. What I want to suggest is that you all, I'm sure, have gotten so good at doing this in your professional life. It is second nature for you when you are developing new products, new services, whatever. What I would like to suggest is that we apply these principles to our own careers. Oftentimes we are so risk averse because we assume that there are huge, terrible consequences in the decisions that we make. And... I want to suggest that we need to start asking the question for, for whatever we do in terms of our career development. I mean, the great thing about, about Alphabet is that you often very easily can move between different jobs within the company. This is a thing that is fairly common and not that hard to do. And so as a result, you have such a, a huge amount of mobility and an ability to try things, whether it's in a different functional role, a different office. Uh, and so 
it in many ways, what we want to ask is, you know, what is what is the smallest bet I can place? What is the smallest, fastest, quickest way that I can test this premise about whether I actually want to learn about this, whether I actually want to try this? And there are ways to do it, whether it's, you know, informational interviews or volunteering on a 20% time project or getting to know people, doing a, a rotation for a set period of time. There are so many ways that we can learn and also simultaneously be de-risking the process. And that's part of how we can make sure that nothing is a failure. The way I think about it, if you go to a casino, if you lose $100,000, that would be a failure. If you go to a casino and you lose a dollar, or you let's say you, you lose $10 because you've placed 10 $1 bets, no one cares. No one notices. Losing $10 is not a failure. It is data gathering. And we need in our own professional lives to think more about how we can place a minimum viable bet and gather more data because we don't fail. Failure is, is not even an appropriate term in those circumstances, but it enables us to make better and smarter choices about our careers. And let me share with you now, before we shift into the Q&A, before we shift into the conversation with Nadia, the last piece about becoming truly a long-term thinker. How do we bring these principles in to become more of a long-term thinker in our lives, in our careers? And the last thing that I'll suggest is that at the end of the day, there's a, a key question that we can be asking ourselves, and that is, what kind of a person do you want to be? Sometimes we get so tied up in, in, the, in the execution or these small pieces, but in the long game, I actually profile a, a colleague and a friend of mine named Alyssa Cohn. She's an executive coach. She's an author. And a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, she signed up for something called Freestyle Love Supreme, uh, which is a improv hip hop beatbox rap class. Uh, it was created by Lin-Manuel Miranda and she got into it because she was a big Hamilton fan. And she said, oh, he's doing a new thing. I want to do that. So she signed up for this improv rap class and you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And she gets to the class and she discovers basically it's her and a enormous number of like 20 year old guys in hoodies who all know how to rap. And she she had never rapped before. So she is so nervous and feels so self-conscious that after that first class, she emailed the instructor and she said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I think I'm in the wrong place. I think I should drop out of the class. This is obviously not the class for me. And he wrote back with some wisdom, some real wisdom. And he said, Alyssa, the goal is not to make you a professional rapper. The goal is is to help you become a more creative and uninhibited person. And she thought about that and she realized that's right. She hadn't signed up for the class, obviously, uh, to become a professional rapper, although she did later on, in fact, make a rap video which she put about executive coaching, which she put up on YouTube. That's what this screenshot is here. Um, she did want to become a more creative and uninhibited person. And she realized that the only way to that, the path through, was, in fact, taking this course and learning, despite her discomfort, to push through it and to do it. So she completed this two-month course. She ended up having a showcase rap performance for all of her friends uh, in New York City just before the pandemic shut things down. And she dove into that process because for her, it answered the question, what kind of a person do you want to be? And I think it's a, a useful question for all of us to be asking. So I'll just mention for, for any of you who want to learn more, you know, sort of think more deeply about this question of how to become more of a long-term thinker in your life or in your career, there's a free download you can get. It's at uh, doryclark.com slash the long game. It's a strategic thinking self-assessment. And with that, I am going to hand things over to Nadia. We can stop the screen share now. And Nadia, let's, let's kick it off with our fireside chat. Great. Thank you, Dory. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your suggestions with us. I'll ask you a couple of questions and then we'll open it to questions from the audience. We already have very many. Um, so I, I have I want to say I really enjoyed the long game. It's it's really your best book yet. 
Um, so, so let's address something here. Uh, you, you mentioned that many companies, instead of investing in meaningful innovation, they reward feature innovation, you know, changing the color of an existing product, basically. So, so how, do you how do you suggest companies tackle this, particularly people working at corporations that are under pressure to present results every quarter to Wall Street? Therefore, their performance reviews and promotions reward, you know, the second kind of innovation, not the meaningful one, but the feature one. Yes, it, it's it's so true. And it's such a conundrum, obviously. I think for many people in corporate life, they wish it were different. I mean, they recognize that it's kind of silly at the end of the day to keep changing the color of the box, so to speak, um, rather than focusing on meaningful change. And so I think that in many ways, this is a both and kind of situation. Uh, certainly, if if you are someone who is in leadership, it is important as, as best we can and as much as we can to really beat the drum of the narrative about long-term innovation and to set expectations. Uh, you know, certainly there are some, not many, but a handful of companies on Wall Street that have done this effectively, that have basically, you know, you know, every every quarter they they hit the gong and they say, don't be expecting profits here. Nope. Hey, <laughs> we're we're thinking about something else. And that is hard to do. It is it is important to do where you can. But if you are an executive who is inside a company, if you are not in the, the senior most leadership, if you just don't really have control over this situation and this is the reality that you're in, ultimately what I think we need to do is to, to hold both truths and to navigate things. It It is true that you actually will be rewarded for long-term innovation or great ideas, but the, the problem is that you're, you're not you're not rewarded in the short term. Once you have it and once it works, then fantastic. You know, Wall Street will love you, but it could take years to come to fruition. And so you have to simultaneously, I, I would say, be performative. And it, it really is kind of a performance in terms of recognizing, okay, if, if this is what I have to do to please my boss, or if this is what we have to do to please Wall Street, then we will tinker around the edges to sort of, you know, perform this game so that we can do what is necessary, but, but also to not buy into the ideology around it because some people actually, you know, they get caught up in a cycle where they actually think, oh, that's what's meaningful. That is not what's meaningful. We need to telegraph that we're doing something. Okay, we're making progress. But where we need to keep our eyes on the prize is the slow, steady, long-term improvement. Because that is something, you know, it's not that it will never be recognized. But the problem is just that it gets recognized when, when it is done and it's slow. But if, if we can keep pushing forward in a steady fashion, ultimately when it does come to fruition, the reward will come and it will, in fact, be significant. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let, let's let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, our industry, the tech world, Silicon Valley, is changing so quickly. How can we have long-term thinking and make plans without our plans becoming obsolete by the time we execute them? Because the world is changing so quickly. Yeah, this is this is very true. And in fact, you know, in some ways it ties back to where we started the conversation, which is you do need both long term and short term thinking. It's not like we can get away with just having one or the other. Um, long term thinking is great, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's not helpful if there's a million changes in between now and then you have to, you know, be able to toggle between between both realities. But what I will say, which I think is actually surprisingly liberating is that if you have a long enough goal, you know, let's call it a 10 year goal or something like that, the amazing thing is that you don't actually need to know how you're going to accomplish it. I mean, in some ways it would be ridiculous to even pretend that you could know how you would be accomplishing it because the world is going to change. Your workforce is going to change. Your competitors are going to change. Uh, you know, who literally who your competitors are, are going to change. I mean, you know, who would have thought 
you know, in 1985 that Apple was going to be selling telephones like that wouldn't have made any sense at all. But, you know, the the world shifted and, you know, we we have. Oh, OK. You know, this is this is different. I mean, you know, Alphabet has so many business lines now and the things that are earning you revenue now may be very different 10 years in the future. It may be a different kind of company because at the enterprise level, Alphabet has become so good at placing small bets on a lot of different things. And so ultimately, I think where we where we need to, to go and to recognize is all we need to focus on is the long-term goal and the next step. Because if we just keep, you know, it's like driving in the fog, right? If we keep, you know, okay, three feet, three feet, three feet, we haven't crashed yet. It enables you to pivot. The road could be twisty. There could be turns. There could be mountains. There could be detours. But you can handle it because you're at least able to see in front of you. But if you are directionally correct, if you know you need to head north and you just keep heading north, even if there, there's a lot of uh, pivots that are necessary, eventually you will get there. And so I think that we often worry too much about the idea of, oh, gosh, how am I going to figure it out? What's the exact plan? I think it's a lot more uh, healthy and liberating to recognize that even if you crafted an exact plan, it's probably not going to play out that way. Statistically, the, f the idea that, you know, in, in 2021 or 2022 that you can perfectly predict, you know, like the 30,000 individual steps between now and, you know, 2032 seems highly unlikely. It is much more likely that whatever you come up with will be proven incorrect. And so better to just focus on the general intention and then keep moving forward toward it. Thank you. This makes so much sense. Um, so let's jump on with questions from the audience. Uh, there is a question from Jennifer Wang. Uh, Hi, Dory. I have loved every talk you've done, including this. Uh, I'm curious, what were some of your signs you held on to during your deception phase? Ah, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. So if I think about how I apply this personally, and of course, you know, we all have would have our own versions depending on our field or our industry. But for me, something that I did about a decade ago, which which really was a bet, it was a strategic bet that I placed, I felt that in terms of the the business that I had, I, I started my consulting, you know, slash executive coaching business in 2006, and you know, kind of a kind of a problem that I had. I was 27 when I started it, and I had never I never worked in a corporation, so the so I didn't know people in corporations, and unfortunately, people in corporations are the ones that have budgets. So I knew all of these people in like completely underfunded nonprofits, and I thought, you know. I can make a passable business for myself if I just keep doing this, but I'm not going to really ever have a, you know, a super successful business. Like it'll be fine, but not great. And I wanted it to be great. So I realized that I needed to do something different. And for me, what that looked like is I, I thought, okay, I somehow need to level up my network. I probably can't do that organically because the people that I know, I don't even think they know the, you know, the, like this, this other group of people like corporate executives. So I have to somehow get folks to know who I am and to come to me. And so the bet that I placed was that through content creation, I could do that. So I went all in. I mean, literally for about a three year period, my income dipped by about 30% deliberately. I mean, it was painful, but it was deliberate because what I, uh, what I was kind of betting was if I jettisoned some of my um, lower paid work and reallocated that time to writing basically for free, some of, most of it was literally for free, some of it was almost for free, um, in places like Forbes or the Harvard Business Review, et cetera, that it would, it would give me an entree to a different group of people that could help take my business to the next level. And so, you know, for a long time, uh, you know, actual work is a lagging indicator, right? But the, the, the little, you know, hints uh, that you're on the right track, they start to come sooner. And so it would be things that are, that are very small and subtle, like, 
you know, in the early days, you might have to like really pitch somebody hard and persuade them to come, you know, be interviewed by you if you're doing a piece. But later on, if they've heard of you, they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to. And it becomes easier for them to say yes. Or at first, you have to constantly be like, please, please, can I interview you? And later, PR people or even the principals themselves start reaching out and they say, oh, would you please profile me? Would you please interview me? And the, the power dynamic shifts. So you start to see signs like that. You start to see people in other publications coming to you and the publications are like, oh, we see you write for X and Y and Z. Would you write for our publication? Would you write for our publication for money? I mean, again, none of this is a lot of money, but even like still, it's like, oh, okay, that's a sign. So it's monitoring those small things to be able to see, oh, okay, I guess this is kind of working in terms of what the thesis was, which was raising my profile. And then the down, you know, the downstream indicator, which takes several years, is actually getting you know, more corporate business from this activity, but you look for those tiny signs to get through the deception phase. Great. No, this is, this is, I love it. Uh, you know, this is a great segue for a question from Logan Vadivelu. Uh, hi, Dory. Uh, the deception phase point is very vital for articulating progress. What techniques would you advise to use to avoid deception and create some clarity for other stakeholders? Yeah, thank, thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Logan. I love it that people are homing in on the deception phase. I think it's a, a really fascinating concept as well. And, you know, I think one of the things that for me is most helpful when it comes to sort of avoiding the trap of the deception phase is accurate scoping. And here is what I mean by that. It is so common, you know, even, even for very smart people, right? It's so common for us to kind of get excited about a, a project or an initiative and just kind of plunge in without taking the time at the outset to really understand and scope out, like, what is this actually going to take? Like, how long do we think it's going to take to build it? How long do we think it's going to take to validate it? How long do we think it's going to take to actually start getting, you know, real customers and money coming in in a legitimate way, et cetera. And we, we often, you know, obviously we have ideas in our head about it, but they're very often implicit. They're never consciously articulated. They're never stress tested. And so what frequently happens is that we get a certain way down the road, you know, some indeterminate point, and a bell goes off in our head because we've hit this this number or this limit or something where we think it should have been differently. Like, oh, you know, it should have been like a couple of months ago that we were getting, you know, our first hundred customers. And why is it taking so long? And you start to kind of freak out a little bit. And so you go a little longer, you go a little longer, and it's like, why is it not happening? What's wrong? And so... This is often the point in the deception phase where we give up because we think we're being smart and rational. We think, oh, well, I've, gi I've given this every opportunity. You know, clearly it just didn't work or, you know, it didn't, it didn't um, you know, there wasn't product market fit in some way. So we give up. But, you know, sometimes that's the right move. But it's also true that sometimes because of that inaccurate scoping, we are making a mistake because we are failing to tell the difference between something not working and something not working yet. And we might think we've given it plenty of time. That actually might not be plenty of time. It might not have been sufficient time and it might have worked had we given it more. And just, just as one example from a, uh, a, a, co a colleague of alphabets uh, in the, I love this story in the 2018 shareholder letter um, for, for Amazon shareholders, Jeff Bezos tells a story about a handstand, about a hand, specifically he had a friend who hired a handstand coach to help her get better at handstands in yoga, which I love. That's kind of wacky. But the important point here is that the handstand coach revealed an important truth. He said that the average person, if you kind of ask them to guess how long it takes to become proficient at handstands, they will say two weeks that is not true. It actually takes six months of daily practice. You know, for those keeping score, that's 24 weeks. It is a factor of 12 difference. 
And if we do not consciously research this, consciously look into it and articulate our assumptions, we, you know, you could be practicing handstands every day for three months. You don't get it. You say, oh, this is terrible. I'm never going to get it because I should have gotten it in two weeks. I've been doing this for 12 weeks and I'm not seeing any progress. Well, guess what? You're only halfway there. But if you don't know that, you know, you think you signed up for a 5k and actually you're running a marathon. Of course, you're going to give up. You're going to give up and you're going to feel completely legitimate in that because, oh, I gave it every chance, but you got the scoping wrong. And so this is why it's so, so important to, number one, research the process. Has anyone done something like this before? If so, what did it look like? How long did it take them? What were the steps? What can you find out about it? What are your assumptions? Write them down. Take the implicit and make it explicit. And, you know, really just be thinking what are the signs of progress? Are there sort of small, tiny things, you know, much like me in the deception phase saying, oh, you know, gosh, I'm noticing there's a difference that people are saying yes to my interview requests much more frequently. There's a higher hit rate or they're saying yes much more quickly. You know, whatever those little metrics are, those kind of hidden metrics that other people would gloss over, identify them. And those are the signs that you're moving in the right direction. No, this is great. Uh, and by the way, uh, we are running out of time and we have a lot of questions so <laughs> i'll try to tackle as many and if if not I'll, i i will commit to contact my colleagues and try to answer their questions from you um with your answers so question from henry fallon hi dory you mentioned that no time is the reason most people say blocks them from doing strategic thinking did you also hear I don't know how to do it. How would you answer that? Yeah, Henry, that's that's great. Uh, or possibly an Henri. Hello. Bonjour, Henri. <laughs> so I absolutely. Uh, no time is a very common, you know, excuse or reason why people are not doing strategic thinking. But it is also true that, you know, some people are not sure where to start. Um, also, you know, in, in the long game, I actually talk about some other, you know, what I call hidden reasons behind it. Um, one, one reason is that sometimes honestly do being willing to do strategic thinking means opening ourselves up to uncomfortable information. You know, if, if we have been proceeding on a certain path for a while, and if we actually asked ourselves questions about, is this the right path? Sometimes we might have some answers that are not what we want. And so we often um, might tend to avoid that for almost you know, subconscious or hidden reasons. And so that can be that can be a challenge. But it's also true to your point that sometimes people really aren't sure where to start with strategic thinking. And so I'll actually give some some examples, as a matter of fact. Um in, in the long game, I talk about uh, a, you know, sort of strategic thinking session that I had one day that was, it was very fruitful. I was just off of a flight uh, to Russia, actually. I do some teaching in Russia and I was super jet lagged, but, you know, I was, I was too awake to sleep, but also too sleepy to do, you know, like detail oriented work. So it was actually kind of a perfect state because I, you know, I was just like, my brain's making all these connections. So I was feeling very like creatively fertile. So I sat down in this cafe in St. Petersburg, Russia, and I, I made a list of questions for myself to answer. So actually I will read them to you in case they're helpful to you. So if somebody's like, ah, I don't know where to start with long-term thinking, what I would say, here's a few useful questions that you can just kind of brainstorm on. Just, you know, it, it's not like, you have to, you know, be so rigorous, but see what comes up when you ask yourself questions like, what should I be spending my time doing? What are the 20% of my activities that will yield 80% of my results? The famed Pareto principle at play here. What can I stop doing or what should I stop doing? How can I use constraints to my advantage? That's always an interesting one. And lastly, what are my hypotheses about the future and how do they inform my actions today? Just starting to think about those questions and, and seeing what answers come up often can be you know, kind of a, a good trail of breadcrumbs to get you started with strategic thinking. Great. Uh, this, these are great questions. Uh, let's talk about uh, Rolls Martin's question. This is a very interesting one. 
I have seen Oryx in a short term adrenaline fueled execution mode. And we all, when an opportunity presents for a strategic thinking, the org collapses from exhaustion. Any thoughts on breaking this cycle? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, Raul, I, what you're describing is surprisingly common. And it, it, and honestly, it's common, not just in organizations, but often in people. I, I say, <laughs> I say this with great empathy because, uh, I'm, I'm now, you know, having, having this, this, uh, Google conversation, uh, about two and a half months after my book launch, but for about a month, you know, so, so I'm better now, don't worry. But, uh, I, I mentioned this to Nadia for about a month dur like during and immediately after my book launch, I actually had this like super weird symptom where I had like a completely dry mouth. Like I could be drinking a hundred glasses of water and it still wouldn't make my mouth wet. Like just all the saliva was gone. I'm like, what is happening? And it turns out this is what happens when there is a, uh, an overabundance of adrenaline in your system, your mouth dries out. And so basically for like a month, my body was sort of in fight or flight mode around the book launch. I mean, this is crazy. This is like what we do to ourselves. Uh, and so yay, I'm committing to being healthier. <laughs> but I think a lot of us as professionals do this in our job and it just becomes a, a constant state of affairs and enterprises create this culture for themselves. They are not, of course, actually people, despite what the IRS says, so their mouths don't go dry. But there's the metaphysical you know, and metaphorical equivalent of all of that. So when it comes to thinking about how do we actually, you know, we've been going, 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 and then we have the chance for, for short, you know, for, to change from short-term thinking to long-term thinking, and then, uh, you know, everybody collapses. Of course, that's, it, it makes sense because number one, we have forgotten how to, how to shift and you're just running on fumes. And so there's, there's like nothing left to give. So first of all, just to kind of paint the ideal state that hopefully I think all of us want to be striving for. One of the biggest mistakes that I see when I'm coaching executives or, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with individuals is we often tend, you know, any successful person tends to basically try to keep doing the same thing over and over again, because this makes logical sense. But the problem is that we also have to try to develop the wisdom and the perspicacity to recognize we are not assembly line workers, right? It's not, it's not like your job literally is like, I'm going to do this widget, you know, 10,000 times a day. What we need to recognize is that as knowledge workers, there are actually waves, there's patterns, we have to shift what we do. And, you know, life is both a sprint and a marathon. And so we need to be cognizant that we, we can't be the same way all the time, we have to understand when it's appropriate to do one thing and then, you know, shift into the next phase so that we can do that. It's about balancing things out. So, you know, similarly with heads up and heads down mode, right? Sometimes it's execution mode, but it shouldn't always be execution mode because you need to pop your head up and be like, Hey, am I executing on the right things? <laughs> so you need both. Um, so ultimately for the case of the organizations, Raul, that you're describing where, you know, they're, they're already in a state of frenzy and disarray. I would say that, you know, it, it can be very hard for individuals to be able to, um, to do all of this. I would suggest probably one of two things. One is that you might actually, you know, want or need to bring in fresh blood to help. You know, if, if, every, if everybody who's been doing things is so burned out, maybe a new person coming in might actually be able to help with long-term thinking because they, you know, they haven't been doing the, um, the sprinting. And so they might have the outside perspective to be able to, uh, to guide it. Now, of course, there's questions of trust. A lot of people don't want like some outsider telling them what to do. So it would have to be chosen uh, carefully, but they might actually have the, the mental and emotional bandwidth to be able to do it. The other thing is it might be, pos you know, one possibility is that rather than immediately shifting from the sprint into the marathon, from the short term thinking into the long term thinking, maybe, you know, to the point of like, you know, exhaustion, et cetera, maybe there's like a little hiatus. Maybe there's some kind of a met metaphorical break 
just like a recovery period before shifting in to the long-term thinking so that you're able to reset a little bit and think more clearly. So I, I hope that helps and great question. Yeah, no, this helps a lot. And there, you know, we have two more questions. And uh, so let's go over. Uh, Jacob Kreiner. Uh, hi, Dory. Wonderful talk. I focus a lot on developing keystone habits. This is a great question. Um, I avoid my inbox for the first hour. What strategies do you use for the long game? Let's get very tactical there. Yeah, let's totally get tactical. Jacob, thank you for writing in and thank you for sharing um, your experience as well. I think this is often a, a very good one that, you know, it's easy for our inboxes to kind of throw us off our game because inevitably there's, you know, somebody who needs something and it, and it might, it might not even be like that essential. I got an email this morning from a client of mine. It's, you know, nearing year end. Oh, you know, that payment I made to you, my bookkeeper needs an invoice. Like, okay. You you know, I'm sure she needs it and it's important to her, but it is it is objectively not the most important thing for me to be doing. Like, let's gin up an invoice, you know, for something that has already been paid like two months ago. That is not the strategic priority. And so it's very useful for us to to really get clear about, OK, what is our strategic priority so that we can focus in on that uh, and, and do that during the time that we are the freshest in our work. So I love what you are doing. As we think about, you know, other sort of specific tactics and ways that we can all become a little bit more strategic in our day-to-day -day activities, one of the things that I think about, and, you know, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of, of New Year's resolutions, uh, although I have my own spin on it, which is that I like to uh, make goals, first of all, in six-month increments, because I feel like a year is actually sometimes a little long, depending on depending on a goal, um, I like to give myself the opportunity to re-up it after six months if I want, but also to change it after six months. But typically at the beginning of the year and then in the middle of the year, I like to choose no more than two high-level uh, professional aspirations for myself that I, I consider to be discretionary activities. Now, of course, we all have the regular day-to-day -day things. Yes, we have to answer email. Yes, we have to you know do the things for our clients or for our boss or whatever. That's, that's just like, I'll call it maintenance mode that we have to do. But above and beyond it, there's, I, there's room typically for one to two discretionary activities to focus on. And, you know, in my case, it might be like, okay, book launch or like redo the website or, you know, something like that. And so the way that I think about playing the long game is just really making sure that us outside of, you know, all of the, the sort of just regular day-to-day -day things that have to happen, basically everything else that I do needs to somehow align with that activity. So if I'm doing a podcast or something like that, if, you know, if somebody asks me about that, under normal circumstances, I may or may not say yes. But if my goal is I'm going to market my book for the next six months and that that's the focus, if that aligns, and of course it would, then that would move to the front of the line. And I would just make sure that, that you know, we have perfect alignment between the, the one or two areas of focus and everything that I do that's above and beyond what's required. So I hope that helps. And Jacob, great question. Yes, it, it, it does help. Thank you so much, Dory. And last question from the always amazing Jen Wantuk. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk, Dory. Uh, what advice do you have for new entrants to the workforce who might feel that they are not working on strategic work? Yes, great, great point and great question, Jen. And it's true, certainly as we rise in our career, as we get a little bit more professional seniority, it becomes more likely that our work will sort of have strategic elements baked into it. But if you are relatively new in your career, oftentimes what people want basically is a pair of hands, you know, ah, do this. You might, you might not even know why you're doing it, but you know, do this. It's like, okay. And so, you know, your job kind of feels like, okay, I just have to like please this person and do this thing. And after a while, it, it may not feel very strategic. It may just feel like, okay, this is, you know, strictly utilitarian here. So I think in those instances, if, if the meat of your job is about executing strategies that other people are putting into place, you may not have a lot of control over that. But what you certainly can have control over is what are the skills that you are building and developing on your own 
and what what is the context that you're developing so i think for somebody who's relatively new in the workforce if you can you know use your discretionary time and effort to develop particular expertise in certain areas and you get to pick because it's voluntary uh, what those things are, you know, develop a, a certain expertise in, you know, a particular type of marketing or a partic particular modality or a new technology or a particular region, whatever it is, you can actually make yourself quite valuable by learning those things. And then just making sure that you're communicating and telegraphing to your boss and colleagues that you have, in fact, you know, taken this program, learned this thing, developed this skill so that they'll understand, oh, you know, she's really working on developing herself. This is a proactive person. And additionally, uh, it's useful to ask questions about why uh, you've been assigned to do these things for sure. And, you know, try your best independently to develop a context around it. You know, reading, reading things about the industry, making sure that rather than just, you know, even if, if people are treating you like a cog in the wheel, you don't have to think of yourself as a cog in the wheel. You can be reading, you know, all of all of the the things, you know, you know, Kara Swisher and TechCrunch and The Verge and the this and the that, you know, so that you understand, OK, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Who are our competitors? You know, oh, I'm doing this so that we can be better than this other company at this thing because we want to be reaching these customers. The more you, you know, question, smart questions you ask of the people around you who are handing you things, and the more that you're independently developing a context, it will enable you to ask smarter questions and to be better informed. Because the minute somebody says to you, you know, do this, and you're able to say, oh, fantastic, I assume we're doing this because of A, B, and C. And also, given D, wouldn't it make sense for us to add functionality around E? They're going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you are going to throw them off and they're going to say, okay, we are clearly not just dealing with a set of hands here, but actually someone who is a smart strategic thinker. Well, thank you so much, Dory. This is great. And thank, thanks again for writing The Long Game. This was fantastic. Thank, thank you for you, coming. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye.